Dr. Proci, I present Dr. Richard Garassi. Trustees Andy Cortez and Joan Nicholas will assist with placing the hood on the shoulders of Dr. Richard Garassi. Born in Brooklyn, New York, Richard Garassi rose to become a nationally recognized educator and the longest serving president of Wagner College. After earning a bachelor's degree in economics at Fordham University, Richard Garassi went on to receive a master's degree in economics from Indiana University, as well as a PhD in political science from the same institution. Then, during his early years as a professor at St. Lawrence University, Richard began to distinguish himself as a pioneer in economic innovation and academic pioneering, leading a group of scholars that created that university's freshman program. Then, after serving as dean of Hobart College in Geneva, New York, Richard returned to the Big Apple in 1997, having been appointed academic vice president here at Wagner. Already during his first year here, Richard guided an enthusiastic group of faculty in the creation of now what is known nationally and applauded nationally as the Wagner Plan for the Practical Liberal Arts. It was only five years later in 2002 that Richard became the 18th president of Wagner College. Since becoming president, Dr. Garassi, in addition to his other achievements, has grown our endowment from four million to around $92 million. Richard Garassi, Richard Garassi also strengthened our ties to the surrounding community. In 2009, he initiated a partnership between Wagner College and a coalition of businesses, schools, churches, and nonprofits in the nearby neighborhood of Port Richmond, a partnership that has successfully addressed significant challenges within that community while also enhancing student learning and raising civic awareness here at Wagner. But Dr. Garassi has not only been a leader at Wagner College, he has also been a national leader in the community of higher education, holding an impressive array of key leadership roles in nationally recognized academic bodies. Significantly, he currently serves as board chairman of the prestigious Association of American Colleges and Universities. But to simply list the accomplishments of Richard Garassi or to chronicle the honors he has received would fail to capture the true qualities of the man as a caring mentor, an understanding colleague, and a respected leader. One example here must suffice. The sky was luminescent blue that morning of September 11, 2001. The freshmen in Harborview Hall had been at Wagner for less than two weeks. At 8.46 a.m., smoke began to rise from the World Trade Center across New York Harbor. A jet plane had crashed into the North Tower. Students in Harborview began looking out their windows toward the city. They watched in shock as a second jetliner hit the South Tower. At 9.03, the South Tower, Tower collapsed and at 9.59, the North Tower fell into rubble. New York City was in lockdown. Wagner College was locked down. People, students, couldn't leave, couldn't go home. It was not long after when Richard went over to Harborview and with two other administrators went to every room to make sure that our newly minted freshmen were okay. Richard set a calming tone, and soon many of the students, rather than being alarmed, wanted to know how they could help in the face of such tragedy. The campus pulled together impressively. Richard had helped turn a tragedy into an opportunity for service, for bonding, for community. It was then that Richard set an example, as he has so often since, 
set an example for so many of our students, set an example for action, for caring, for leadership. And so now, before he concludes his presidency next month, it is our privilege, our pleasure, our honor to recognize Richard Garassi, the longest serving president in Wagner College history, with a degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa. Another very, very pleasurable task. With the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Wagner College and the laws of the State of New York, I hereby confer upon you, Richard Garassi, the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa, and thereby declare that your name forever be inscribed, and I'll emphasize that again, forever be inscribed on the roll of Wagner College's most esteemed alumni. Thank you, Dr. Prochi, and thank you to the Board of Trustees. I am truly, truly deeply honored to receive this recognition. As you know, for the past 22 years, Wagner College has had my heart and my mind. This is such a very special community and a special place as witnessed the two wonderful speeches of our students, and it means the world to me to become a permanent part of the wonderful alumni of this college. As importantly, it means so much to me to be included with all of you in the class of 2019. I know many of you personally, and I'm quite confident that you're going to achieve many milestones in your careers. And many of you will receive honors similar to this one that I'm so humbled to be awarded today. I have great faith in your generation to produce a substantial number of outstanding leaders, and I truly mean this, which are so badly needed in meeting today's serious social and environmental and economic challenges. Congratulations to all of you and to your families that have supported you in your journey to commencement. Today, you are graduating from a fine college, a very fine college, and you are well prepared for your next steps in pursuit of a successful career. You have the benefit of working with a dedicated and highly accomplished faculty as well as many equally committed administrators and coaches and campus supporters. Some of you may be uneasy about the next steps, very understandable. They await you whether in graduate or professional education, in your first postgraduate job, or as a graduate student looking to increase your professional standing. Some are just looking for that great break to launch a career in performance or athletics, just like when you began college here or in your graduate education here, this can be a moment of great new beginnings, but also a moment of great anxiety. I want to assure you that you will succeed in your career paths precisely because at Wagner you developed certain habits of the mind and of the heart that are the same qualities that correlate with career and professional success. What made you successful these past four or five years in this place, that will become your intellectual and social foundation in the workplace. Here is what so many of you have begun to learn on campus and what employers and graduate schools seek in their best colleagues and students. First, you had to manage, learn to manage your time efficiently, and in doing so, you developed a strong work ethic. I know your resumes. They are full, stuffed with academic, campus and civic obligations. You learned how to manage those efficiently without becoming totally neurotic, an accomplishment in its own right. For all of my time at Wagner, all my 22 years, I've watched Wagner students and alumni outwork, outthink, and outhustle all their competition, and you will too. Secondly, your liberal arts courses taught you to be open to learning new ideas, to be engaged with different cultures from different periods, different cultures from your own, different historical periods, competing value systems, to understand more about the scientific method and the dynamics of the natural world. 
you learn not just to acquire knowledge as a jumble of facts and theories to be recited, but you've begun to develop, and I mean begin, it's called commencement for a reason. You've begun to develop the skill of evaluating ideas and arguments and assess the quality and quantity of evidence supporting them. Most importantly, you've developed and begin to develop, I might add, effective communication skills in writing and in speaking and in listening, in active listening. The Wagner Plan and its learning communities put you in cohort groups right from the beginning and you began to develop teamwork and collaborative learning skills, which are absolutely central to almost every profession from healthcare, the performing arts, business, education, and social services. Thirdly, the emphasis on experiential and civic learning at Wagner helped, to begin, helped you to begin to learn basic field-based skills in solving real-time problems and an openness to linking, again, theory and practice. This sharpened your problem-solving skills. The emphasis here on diversity education at Wagner helps so many of you begin to explore, first of all, your own identities, and then walk in the shoes of those different from yourselves and begin to learn how to work, develop, and succeed in inclusive communities and environments. That is central to success for you going forward. Your civic experiences have taught you how to learn from communities in which you served and how to develop and build civic prosperity and personal opportunity in their lives and in your own lives. These are the essential leadership skills where leadership is not defined as power and authority over others, but rather is that unique ability and confidence to bring diverse individuals with unique identities and attributes together across their differences, their qualities, in achieving extraordinary success. All of these experiences at Wagner have made you successful here. They form the foundation of success in your eventual profession and in your personal lives as well. They are your bedrock for success. You're well prepared, but I believe planning and preparation are engaged in a very dynamic choreography and dance with luck and serendipity. Chance plays a role in destiny. That one unique opportunity that springs itself on you and maybe you see it and seize it or maybe you miss it. I tend to believe that preparation and luck are more entangled with each other than some others believe. One of my all-time favorite quotes that I firmly have come to rely on comes from a very obscure baseball executive for the old Brooklyn Dodgers. His name was, and you'll never believe his name, you'll think it's a, a theatrical name, but this was his real name, Branch Rickey. The Brooklyn Dodgers, as a kid in the 1950s, was my passion as a young boy growing up in Flatbush. And my hero and their star was a guy named Jackie Robinson, the man who broke the apartheid system of Major League Baseball that prevented men of color from playing in the big leagues. Branch Rickey was the executive who fought hard to break the color line, and he recruited Jackie Robinson, an outstanding leader, a man who was able to stand up to the vile and bigotry that he had to stand up to to integrate baseball. He was a remarkable athlete at UCLA and in Pasadena, where our wonderful chair is from. He was a track star, a football star, an all-American football star before he became a baseball player. So when Ricky was asked a couple of years later when Robinson not only went on to break the color line, establish an incredible resilient leadership model, also become an outstanding athlete, the rookie of the year, and then eventually the most valuable player, he was asked, did you get lucky? You must have got lucky when you recruited Robinson. He was just the right guy for the job, the exact perfect man, the leader to integrate baseball, who possessed that courage to stand up to everything thrown at him. And Ricky shot this back, and this is the quote I want you to remember. He looked around and said, lucky, lucky, luck is the residue of design. Luck is the residue of design. What a beautiful quote that is, and let's take that apart a little bit. What this means is that you get to take advantage of luck or chance if you're a big opportunity, if you've prepared yourself first to recognize it, and secondly, if you've built the habits and knowledge and skills to succeed when it actually presents itself. Now, there's been part of my life, many, many times in my life, when this has become true for me. I would not be standing here. I know some of you believe 
that when I was born, the doctor handed me to my mother and I became a college president. <laughs> Doesn't quite work that way. If you drew a line from where I was, when you're sitting here at 21 or 22 or years old or so, to where I am now, it's not a straight line, or it's not even a jagged line, it's a scatter shot. So, <clears throat> I want you to know that in 1969, as one example of the dance between luck and design, in 1969, I was completing my master's degree at Indiana University, and I had been a star student at Fordham in economics. I loved economics because I wanted to take a subject that explained the world to me. It gave me a sense of how things were ordered so I could think about how to make a difference in the world. But I became, when I came to Indiana University in 1969, they largely were teaching economics as mathematics and quantitative skills. And I kept on asking questions. Where is the policy implications of what we're studying? And they said, that doesn't happen in this department. Now, things have changed in economics, but this is 1969. So I had a few, uh, I had completed all of my requirements for the master's degree, and I decided I'm going to terminate with the master's. I'm going to go out in the world and figure out how to make a difference with the skill sets that I had. I wasn't going to pursue the PhD in economics. So I only had this one semester to go. I could take three uh, electives. And I went to the open registration. In 1969 at Indiana University, 32,000 students registered in three days in an open arena in high humidity. You had a 10-minute window to get there. If you didn't get there in that 10-minute window you were assigned, you went to the back of the line, which meant you got none of the courses you were interested in. So I was interested in taking some political science before I graduated, thinking I'll learn something about policy and policy making and impact. So I walked up to, I walked online, I got to my queue, I waited about 20 minutes to get to the front of the political science desk. By the way, this, this arena was so big, it had two nursing stations in case people fainted so they could be taken care of. You didn't have to, as bad as registration may have been any time in your time here, it wasn't that bad. It may have been problematic, but it wasn't that bad. So I got to the front of the line, and I said, I'd like to take a course on the introduction to the American presidency. I'd like to take a course uh, on legislative politics in the US Congress, and I'd like to take a course on international politics. Now, you may have heard this once or twice in your time at Wagner, but I, I was not prepared for this. And I, what I heard back was closed, closed, closed. So I got a little antsy being a graduate student and being from New York, naturally, and I started to argue with the people behind the desk. Now, there were about 100 people behind me online wanting to get their courses, and you had to get these Fortran cards to bring to your class to say that you're actually in it. So all of a sudden, this woman who was sitting two levels behind the people in charge of this table was sitting there knitting away in a chair. Her hair was in a bun with one of those sticks through it. Her glasses were on the bridge of her nose. And she said, you shouldn't be taking those courses anyway. Those are undergraduate courses. You can take them for graduate credit. But you're, you need to be taking the introductory course that all PhD students take in getting, pursuing a PhD in political science. And I looked at her like she was crazy. I never had a political science course in my entire life. How was I supposed to compete with students from Amherst and Williams and all over the place and Michigan and so on and so forth who were stars at their undergraduate institutions, were on full fellowships, and I was going to walk into this class and try to perform. But I took the class. I took the risk, not knowing exactly what this was about. It seemed my only logical path. She seemed to know what she was talking about. So I did it. I took the risk. I was intimidated at first in that seminar. Uh, I, I was quite uneasy. My, all my classmates had exuded an inordinate amount of confidence. They looked at me like I was from Mars. I knew I had to outwork them. I had to outthink them. I had to outperform them. I had to outread them. And I aced that course. And in acing that course, I found out that the woman who directed me to that course was the chairwoman of the political science department at Indiana University. So my non-feminist self at the time doubted her. It turned out her husband, equally famous person, Dr. Vincent Ostrom, was the instructor in the graduate seminar. They offered me, as a result of that course, a full fellowship and full path completely paid for to pursue my PhD in political science. Okay, 40 years later, I met Eleanor, uh, Dr. Eleanor Ostrom on a plane coming back 
from uh, Scandinavia. Eleanor Ostrom, as it turns out, who became my advisor, I published my first major m manuscript with her, turned out to be, and still is, the only woman ever to receive the Nobel Prize for Economics and Political Economy in the history of the Nobel Prizes. We lost each other after graduation, but I soon met her, as I said, on this plane, and we reconnected, and I told her, if it wasn't for that incident, that bit of luck in the registration process in that incredibly dense, humid arena, I would have never ended up becoming a college president at a place I so deeply love. And she said to me, Richard, it wasn't luck. You had the right stuff, you just didn't know it. Well, as, as, she, as, it, as she set me on this course to become a college professor, and of course, all the rest is history, I ended up here with you today in this lovely place and had such a great career. So my point is this, and this is, the, this is the point of it all. Luck is the residue of design. I was prepared as a good student with all the skills that you possess today. I wanted a challenge. I wanted to be involved in social change and make an impact on the world around me. A moment came, I didn't fully recognize all of its possibilities and implications. You won't either. But I took it, and my academic preparation and strong work ethic carried me through that risk ultimately to succeed and be here with you today. My message is that you are prepared. You have the right stuff, and, I've acqui and you've acquired many more skills and good work habits than you realize today. You have the right stuff inside of you. There'll be many moments for you in your careers and your personal lives when luck will be the residue of design, and you will jump in, and who knows where it will take you. I want you to rely on your fundamental assets acquired at Wagner College. Take confidence from them. Be ready for what may appear to be luck, but it really boils down to your training, your courage, and in finding your true self. But just before I end, I think there's one small caveat to all of this that may be another is missing element in your personal success. I must account for the importance of those who believe in you uncritically, those people in your lives who will fight for you, for me, it was my dearest, my best friend, the love of my life since high school, Dr. Karen Garassi. She always, always... <laughs> she always believed in me. And those who give you that uncritical commitment, be it your parents, your friends, your siblings, your partner, or whoever, they are invaluable to you and keep them close. I once said to Karen, what if you had, <clears throat> hadn't met me and you married one of those other fellows who seemed to be taken with you? As a working class kid from Brooklyn, we both came, both kids came from modest beginnings. And I said, you may have ended up marrying a police officer or a sanitation worker. And she looked at me with those eyes that always get my full attention and said, oh, Richard, Richard, if I married one of them, they would become a college president as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, you need the training, you need the little luck, but you need the soulmate as well. Congratulations to all of you. I just adore you. What a wonderful moment.